It's become something of a modern ritual. Declare a long-standing human behaviour a myth, blame it on the patriarchy, and publish the whole thing in the New York Times. That's exactly what Chelsea Conaboy did last year, arguing that the maternal instinct is a socially constructed tool of oppression, a cultural invention that pressures women into child-rearing while freeing men to focus on their careers. Her essay is marketed as bold, feminist, and science-based. But there's a small problem. Science doesn't agree. While there's still so much to learn about sex differences, what we do know is far more substantial than ideologues would have us believe. And the more we discover, the clearer it becomes that human sex differences, including maternal behavior, aren't arbitrary social assignments. They're deeply rooted in biology, evolution, and yes, human nature. Let's start with Conaboy's core claim that maternal instinct is a myth. According to her, the so-called parental brain is a blank slate shaped entirely by cultural expectations. If we simply raise boys and girls the same way, she suggests, men and women would show equal desire and capacity for child rearing. It's a seductive idea, especially in a culture eager to flatten all distinctions between the sexes, but the evidence says otherwise. Across nearly all mammalian species, Males and females invest in offspring differently. In the vast majority of cases, males do very little parenting. Parenting, in the evolutionary sense, is a form of investment, time, energy, and risk dedicated to the survival of one's genes. And typically, it's the females who make the larger investment. Now, humans are a fascinating outlier here. Human fathers do invest more in their children than other primates. Compared to our close cousins, chimpanzees and bonobos, Human dads are hands-on saints, but even in cultures with the most paternal involvement ever recorded, the gap between maternal and paternal care is unmistakable. Consider the Aka people of the Congo, a nomadic group where fathers are famously involved. Anthropologist Barry Hewlett documented their parenting habits. Fathers held their infants for about 57 minutes per day, mothers about 490 minutes, that's more than eight times longer. So why the gap? Well, biology. For one, mothers breastfeed. But more importantly, female primates, humans included, are generally more emotionally and behaviorally attuned to offspring. This attentiveness isn't random. It's consistent, it's widespread, and it begins early. Of course, this doesn't mean every woman is nurturing or every man is distant. There's variation within each sex. Some mothers feel exhausted or detached from parenting. Some fathers are naturally affectionate and hands-on. But these individual differences don't erase the average trends, and they certainly don't render them meaningless. Conaboy does acknowledge some of this, but she frames variation as evidence against innate instincts. In reality, variation is expected, even biologically necessary, for complex behaviours like parenting. And variation doesn't mean symmetry. Brain imaging studies reinforce this asymmetry. When mothers view images or videos of their children, they tend to show higher amygdala activation, the brain region associated with emotions. Fathers, by contrast, show more activation in cortical areas, which are linked to executive function and learned behavior. In simpler terms, mothers often respond to their children with more automatic, emotionally charged reactions. Fathers tend to engage through conscious effort and learned caregiving. Both can be effective parents, but the pathways are different. And critically, those differences aren't just cultural. They emerge from the brain itself. Still, the ideological claim persists that women are subtly coerced into motherhood and kept from the workforce by outdated expectations. But real-world data again fails to support this. In a representative UK survey, only 14% of women identified as work-focused. About 16% were home-focused, and the rest expressed mixed preferences. Crucially, most work-focused women were able to live according to their priorities, holding full-time jobs regardless of family status. In fact, it was the home-focused women who were more constrained, often needing to work due to financial necessity. This isn't the story of a society forcing women into domesticity. It's the story of a species where women, like men, make trade-offs and where preferences vary. And those trade-offs go back deep in evolutionary time. 
At the very core of human sex differences is the biology of sexual reproduction, a system that's been around for at least 1.5 billion years. Sexual reproduction began with the evolution of gametes, reproductive cells. At some point, nature discovered an elegant solution. One cell type would be small, mobile, and plentiful, sperm. The other would be large, immobile, and neutrally rich, eggs. These differences weren't socially constructed, they were biologically selected. This binary, sperm producers and egg producers, is the bedrock of male and female. And despite the efforts of some to blur it, this binary is real, universal, and categorical in mammals. Yes, some species can change sex under certain conditions. Fish do it, worms do it, but mammals don't. Two sexes, no more, no less. Of course, behavior is more fluid than anatomy. Some boys prefer nurturing play. Some girls enjoy rough and tumble games. But these atypical behaviors don't negate sex. Nor do they imply the existence of a third, fourth, or even 52nd gender. Most children, even those with cross-sex interests, grow up to identify strongly with their birth sex. Gender dysphoria exists and should be treated with compassion, but it's exceedingly rare, far rarer than its prominence in online discourse would suggest. The reason? Again, biology. Evolution shaped males and females to differ, not just in reproductive organs, but in psychology, cognition, and behavior. These differences aren't arbitrary. They reflect different evolutionary pressures. In species where males must compete for mates, we tend to see larger males, more aggression, and less parental investment. In species where males help raise offspring, we see a reduction in those traits. Humans lie somewhere in between. Human males are larger than females, a difference dating back millions of years. This size disparity, combined with greater upper body strength, is not the result of cultural gym memberships. It's a reflection of evolutionary pressures, competition among males, defensive territory, and hunting. And that competition didn't just shape muscles, it shaped brains. Men tend to outperform women in spatial skills, object tracking, and projectile accuracy, traits useful for hunting and combat. Women, meanwhile, excel in social cognition, verbal fluency, and empathy, traits linked to parenting, community cohesion, and relational aggression. Yes, you heard that right, relational aggression. Women may not throw punches, but they sure can socially assassinate with surgical precision. Gossip, exclusion, and reputation-damaging behavior are powerful tools, and navigating them requires emotional intelligence, reading faces, decoding body language, and understanding others' thoughts and feelings. Girls tend to develop these skills earlier than boys. And in traditional societies, women who have mastered them have a distinct reproductive advantage, more social allies, more cooperative relationships, and healthier children. These sex differences are subtle at the individual level, but when combined, they create powerful integrated behavioral patterns. Just like physical traits, psychological traits don't exist in isolation. They're part of systems, systems shaped by evolution. This is especially evident in the brain. Minimalists like to argue that sex differences in traits like self-esteem or agreeableness are small, and that's often true when measured individually. But when you analyze entire systems, full personality profiles, or integrated brain networks, the differences become much larger. In one study of nearly 10,000 children, researchers used gray and white matter patterns to classify sex. They were correct 93% of the time. That's not trivial. That's a system. Even prenatally, male and female brains show different activity patterns, indicating that sex-linked brain organization begins before birth. These differences influence how boys and girls process social information, respond to stimuli, and engage with the world. None of this implies determinism. Culture still matters. Social rules can exaggerate or suppress traits. But biology lays the groundwork, and pretending otherwise isn't progressive, it's delusional. So, what's the bottom line? The argument that gender is a blank slate, that maternal instinct is a myth, and that sex is an outdated concept belongs not in scientific journals, but in ideological manifestos. It's a fantasy built on wishful thinking, reinforced by social media echo chambers, and contradicted by nearly every branch of science, 
biology, neuroscience, psychology, and anthropology. There's still so much to learn about sex differences, but what we already know is clear. Male and female aren't just social roles, they're biological realities. And while gender expression may be flexible, the foundations are not. Human nature isn't infinitely malleable. It's not a product of hashtags or ideology. It's a product of evolution. And no matter how loudly the fantasy is repeated, biology always gets the last word. Thanks for watching or listening to this video. It was based on an essay written by David C. Geary, an evolutionary psychologist and cognitive scientist at the University of Missouri. He's best known for his research on sex differences, intelligence, and the biological underpinnings of learning and development. As always, Quillette provides a platform for evidence-based arguments that many mainstream outlets shy away from, especially when it comes to topics where science and ideology collide. If you found this video thought-provoking, challenging, or even a little uncomfortable, that's good. It means this video is doing what it's meant to do, make you think. So here's what you can do. You can like the video to help it reach more people who are tired of ideological spin and want to hear what the science actually says. You can subscribe to the channel if you want to hear more content like this, deep dives into controversial ideas grounded in facts, and share this video with someone who still thinks that we are blank slate and that maternal instinct was invented by the patriarchy. Thanks for watching. I've been Zoe Booth. Stay tuned for more great videos.